Well, good morning. I am going to just make us uncomfortable right from the get-go here. <laughs> I, I want you to think for a moment, I, I want you to think back to that time in life when your parents first sat you down to have the talk. Remember that? That was horrible, right? It, it, it was all this sort of awkward confusion that goes into it. Maybe your parents were a little bit like mine, where they, they sat me down and the conversation was very medical, I would say. And, and it created all kinds of confusion for me. I knew two things were clear, that I didn't understand anything more about sex and what it was and what it's for, and I never wanted to talk to my parents about that again. Or some of you, on the other hand, had, had the sort of parents that were kind of more like the hippie parents, right? And they're using all sort of metaphors from, from nature, and you're just like terrified to go outside ever again. <laughs> the, what crazy stuff is going on out there? And they maybe were almost like that, that too free about talking uh, about the topic. And then there's the handful of you who just had those parents that struck the perfect balance. And you grew up to be well-adjusted adults and great for you this morning. That's, <laughs> the, rest of you, the rest of us can't relate. And then something even worse happens, at least for me. I became a parent. And I had to figure out as my kids came into adolescence how I was going to, I have three daughters, how Sherry and I were going to sit down and have these conversations and make them feel as awkward as my parents made me feel. And this, is, this isn't just a conversation that we're talking about as it relates to how do we effectively have this in, in our homes? How do, we, how do we prepare our kids for, for the realities and everything that's going on in culture and society? And, but we're, we wrestle with that in the church as well. How and when and how frequently do we talk and teach on issues about sex and sexuality? I think oftentimes our tendency can be to relegate these to the realm of the personal. The, these are private issues, and so we, we kind of strategically avoid those passages of Scripture where Jesus is speaking on these personal and private matters. And yet on the flip side of that, our culture does not shy away. In fact, it's, it's everywhere. We, we are surrounded by sex and sexuality nearly everywhere we go. And so in, in a community like this, we can kind of awkwardly dance around these topics. And yet when we leave this building, there will be like a, a fire hose to the face of messaging and images and values that we're told to have. It's so frequent and it's so prevalent that we hardly even recognize it. Jesus, however, did take the time to speak into the topic of sex and sexual desire. Right now, we're, we're in a series entitled With Jesus, where we've been asking ourselves as the church, as this community of believers, what does it look like with us to live with Jesus at this core, at the center of who we are and what we do and what we say, at the very essence of our life? That, that what does it look like to put him where he's our everything? What, what does it mean for you and I to truly live as a disciple of Jesus, to, to, to live as an apprentice of his? And we've discovered that Jesus does not shy away from some challenging and difficult topics. He embraced things head on like issues of, of politics and what it means to be in the realm of the political and things like morality and understanding what, what it is to be good enough and things like Money, and as we'll discover today, he doesn't shy away from the topic of sex either. In fact, I have found it somewhat amazing when you think about over these last several weeks what we've been looking at and studying together how the questions that people brought to Jesus and wanted to debate him on are so relevant to our own culture and society some 2,000 years later. If you have your Bibles with you, let's turn to Matthew chapter 5. We'll pick it up in uh, verse 27. We'll read these together. I'm reading from the NIV this morning. And this is what it says. These are Jesus' words. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said you should not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. 
And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Now, at the very outset, we can see that, that Jesus is emphatic here. There's a couple of things I just want to point out before we really even dive in. First of all, we need to understand that these, these verses that we just read are a part of a collection of Jesus' teaching in, in Matthew that we've entitled the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus is describing for his followers what life in the kingdom is about. So just, just like last week's passage, if you look back in the context of that, Jesus has gathered together. There's all these crowds surrounding Jesus, and in that crowd, there's two types of people. There's those who are there because they're curious, and they've heard the teaching about the teaching of this rabbi, and they want to they wanna experience it and discover it for themselves. But at the same time, there are also those who are gathered there who are, who are the disciples of Jesus. So people who have already heard Jesus' message about the kingdom, and they've, they've responded by placing their faith and trust in him and aligning their lives to that message. So as Jesus is beginning this teaching here in chapter 5, it says early on, it says his disciples came to him and he began to teach them. So Jesus here is, he's speaking to the disciples. He's describing for them what life in the kingdom of God looks like. And I mention this because I think sometimes it, it, we can misplace who Jesus is, is aiming his teaching or his words at. Now, again, there's crowds of seekers, onlookers, who are overhearing intentionally what Jesus is teaching. He's not trying to hide this. But if you're here and you are a follower of Jesus, this is, this is aimed at us. Jesus is teaching this to us. And if you are here and you're not a follower of Jesus, you're saying, I'm, I would not call myself a disciple of Jesus. Of course, you're always welcome. We're so glad you're here. And, and this teaching is important, but this is not the essential question that I would encourage you to wrestle with even today as, as we go through this passage. It's not what Jesus teaches us about sex and sexual desire, but rather about what Jesus teaches throughout Matthew 5 and beyond about his kingdom and who he is and what he's ushered in and the invitation that he extends to us by his grace through faith. That's, that's the primary question I would encourage you to wrestle with this morning. And I, I think it's important that we don't get those things reversed. But secondly, the subject matter that Jesus is addressing here, it, it, it starts off with this question about adultery or the topic of adultery. But really what Jesus is driving at here is the issue of, of sexual desire. And so just as Jesus does throughout the entire Sermon on the Mount, he, he will take a behavior and he sort of pulls back the curtain in order to deal with what drives, what motivates that behavior. So, so Jesus is interested in getting at the core of the issue, at what's going on in the heart, because Jesus didn't come to merely modify our behavior. That's not his goal. Jesus came to transform our hearts. And so as he's describing the kingdom of God, he's, he's describing to people, disciples of Jesus, he's saying, with, this is what I want, a transformed life, to look like. So here is the overarching question that I want us to keep in mind as we work our way through this text this morning. If you are identifying yourself as a follower of Jesus, the question is, what impact does Jesus' rule and reign in our lives have on our sexual desires or the action that results from our sexual desires? So let, let's break down Jesus' view or framework of, of sex a bit here. And first, I want to begin by just saying that Jesus' view of sex is that sex is, is good. Sex is good. I, um, I grew up in the, in, around the church, many of you know that, and kind of the late 80s, early 90s were like my youth group years. And one of the, one of the movements at the time was sort of the, the purity movement. And some of you maybe can remember this. But they would have sometimes conferences or gatherings or our youth group would get us together and sit down and they would talk about the birds and the bees and, and present this message of abstinence and, and why that was the best way. And it would oftentimes respond in a call and you would come inside a card and that was, it was good stuff. 
But, but what I, the message I somewhat inadvertently got, because some of the tactics behind it, the motivation behind it, was, was everything we had to be afraid of. So they would talk about what happens with teenage pregnancy and stats around that, and they would talk about STDs, and they would talk about all these things that, that go into this, and, and you're kind of just terrified. So my view of sex coming out of like youth group, and, and I'm not blaming anybody for this, was like sort of like my view of anthrax, right? Like, <laughs> if you get too close, you're going to die, is, is the, my basic understanding that I lived with. But this, this isn't how Jesus views or understands sex and our sexual desire. And I think it's important to, to mention this because this passage is sometimes used to present a case or to suggest that Christians hold to or that Jesus taught this really repressive view of sex. And that, that, that just isn't the case. In fact, if you flip over a pages to Matthew 19, Jesus again is, is asked a question. This time it's on the topic of of divorce, and we get a little bit of a larger framework for how Jesus understood the topic. He says, haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning of creation, at the beginning, the creator made them male and female, and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And so they, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. So Jesus here is addressing this question on divorce, but what I want us to see for our purposes today is that his view of sex is formed out of Genesis 1 and 2, out of creation. So, so in Jesus' mind, this is, this is a part of God's design. God intended it and he created it, and like everything God creates, when he created it, he says it's good. In, in fact, when God creates humankind with gendered body and puts them together in the garden in a covenant relationship and he tells them, be fruitful and multiply, he doesn't just say it's good. On that day, he says it's very good. When you go back and, and you look at what God designed before sin entered the picture, before everything gets messed up, you see this, this picture of human sexuality that is without shame. It's, it's good. So Jesus' view on sex is, is born out of creation, and it comes with design and purpose. Sex is, is God's idea. It was not a surprise to him. However, to say that, that, that sex is, is good is also a bit simplistic. Tim Mackey, who is a, a pastor, if you've ever watched any of the, um, um, oh man, now I'm forgetting the name of it, They're the, the Bible videos that we've used from time, does anybody know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about, anyways. <laughs> Bible Project, thank you, yes, the Bible Project videos, they're excellent, and, and he's also got a podcast called Exploring My Strange Bible, but he, he talks about this, he says it's a complex good. So to say that it's good is, is, is a bit oversimplistic. And by saying that, that, that we don't really fully understand the, the um, extent of Jesus' view on sex. Because yes, it is good, but it is a complex good. The, the illustration that often used for this to explain this is that of fire. I have a picture that, uh, from last Thanksgiving where my family went out to Ojai, California for my cousin's wedding whole extended more side of the family. It was an amazing time. We were on this walnut, black walnut ranch in Ojai. And that's a picture of some of my family. If you look to the right, my 90, almost 93-year-old grandfather is sitting there, and it was so, such an incredible time, just so life-giving. We would gather on the fire in the evening, and, and we would tell stories on Thanksgiving Day. Instead of doing a traditional meal, we had, we had hot dogs and hamburgers that we cooked over the fire, and there's so many, so many memories, so many stories, so much good that came around that fire. And yet four days after we left there, the, the Thompson wildfires broke out. And if you remember, this is by Ventura, California, this is, and, and swept through Ojai. In fact, one of the homes on that property that we stayed at was, was burnt to the ground. And much of their black walnut ranch, the trees were, were destroyed because, because it, it was outside of this protective environment. 
the Song of Songs, which is this Old Testament book that, that, that speaks to the passion and the design and the purpose of human sexuality. It, it, it uses this illustration, this metaphor of, of fire for desire and passion in the context of the covenant relationship of marriage. It's this incredibly good thing when it's in an environment that protects its power according to its design and purpose. When, it, when it's used for human flourishing and for giving of life. However, like, like all things that are a complex good, when it's taken out of that protective environment, it's, it's incredibly destructive. We, we don't really have to make a case for this. We see it all around us, all the time, in our culture, in our relationships. The evidence is, is everywhere. So, so culturally, we've, we've elevated the idea of consent to be the highest imperative. And I'm not, I don't, hear, don't mishear me, I'm not minimizing that. We've said that that's the protective environment, however, but Jesus goes beyond consent and he says, no, it's, it's covenant. It's covenant relationship, the covenant relationship between one man and one woman that ultimately protects the complex good that God created sex and sexual desire to be in this environment. So Jesus' view, his understanding of, of sex is that sex is good, that God designed it and, and he purposed it and he, he's for it. But when it's operating according to its design. But then Jesus goes on to teach us if sex is good... Then, then lust is, is bad. I know that seems overly simplistic, but th this is what Jesus is driving at here. I, uh, I, I, several years ago when my kids were little, um, it was one of those times in our home where, where the stomach bug was going through our house. And it was like there were bodies strewn everywhere, you know, like, and, and then the worst thing happens where Sherry goes down, my wife goes down, and I'm, I'm the, it's, I'm, it's up to me at this point. And I literally created like a hazmat suit that I wore around the house. I tied like a shirt around my head, I had rubber gloves, I had like holsters with Clorox in it, like I could spray stuff right, because you're, you're looking at it and you think there's this, there's this underlying unseen thing that takes that which is healthy and makes it unhealthy. It makes it sick, in fact. So this is what Jesus is driving at here. Look again at verse 28 in, in, in Matthew chapter 5. He says, But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. See, so think again for a moment about what Jesus has been doing throughout the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus takes an Old Testament law, a, a commandment, in this case, do not commit adultery, and he doesn't dismiss that or replaces it. Instead, he fulfills it. So six times throughout the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is going to say, you've, you've heard it said, this is, this is how you've understood it, but, but I tell you. So he's taking the action that they all agreed upon, was, was fully understood was wrong, and he peels back the layers in order to reveal the condition of the heart that ultimately led to, to the action. See, no one ever wakes up, or it's extremely rare, and, and finds himself in bed with somebody who isn't their spouse and just decided that morning when they woke up, you know what, this is, I think I'm just going to have an affair. I, I've never in all my years had that situation come in to, for pastoral counseling. You, we understand something like adultery is the result of a thousand little decisions that, that generate in the heart and that ultimately show themselves or reveal themselves in an action. And so Jesus takes the action. He says adultery is really just a symptom of lust. But then he goes beyond that and he says lust is a symptom of the heart. It's a heart that has reduced another human being to the level of an object to be used for our own self-gratification and pleasure. See, when Jesus talks about, about lust here, and it's important for us to stand this, he's not, he's not talking about recognizing beauty. 
Th that is, is, you don't control that. That's an impulse. You see it and you recognize it. He's not even talking about attraction or, or de desire. I think I would argue that those are part of the good that he created in us as sexual beings. Jesus, when he talks about lust, he's talking about desire that is out of control. He, he's talking about an act of the will. Lust, again, to, to quote Tim Mackey, lust is that movie that plays in the mind that we choose to generate. It's completely private. We all, we all know what Jesus is talking about here. We've all seen it. We've either been the victim of it or you've been the perpetrator of it or both. So Jesus is he's taking us back to the heart level issue here where, where it's completely private. Where, where it's impossible to create a, a law in order to prevent it. And he says, I want, I want to deal with that. I want, I want to get at that. Because in my kingdom, we, we live, when we live under the rule and reign of Jesus, we cannot reduce another human being who, who again, Genesis tells us, bears the image of God to an instrument for our own selfish purposes. As a mean of, means of fueling our own sexual desire. And this, by the way, according to Jesus, it, it's a violation of the center of his kingdom, the, the central ethic of his kingdom. We talked about this a, a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about morality, but Jesus boils down all, he says, all the wall and the prophets, it comes down to these two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Matthew 22, and love your neighbor as yourself. See, Jesus is saying lust is it's a violation of this central ethic of my kingdom. L lust is a violation of love. It's, it's the reduction of another human being to the status of an object. And Jesus says it, it doesn't belong in the heart of a, of, of a disciple. It it's doesn't belong in my kingdom. To, to look at a woman lustfully, according to Jesus, is to, is to violate her in our hearts. This is the reason that, that pornography is such a just an incredibly destructive evil. As much as, as culturally we have worked to convince ourselves that it's harmless, that it's this natural outlet of, of, of sexual desire, it is, it is the reduction of another human being. It denigrates them and it addicts us. And as Jesus is pointing out here, that's, that's, just, that's just the beginning. It's just the heart condition that ultimately leads to much further destruction. Yes, things like adultery and affairs, but, but to abuse, to assault. There's an undeniable link. I, I, I think as the church, we have, to, we have to be committed to confronting the core issue. We, we, we cannot allow this to remain in the shadows and, and to be stand in silence. These issues in our culture, in our society, in our church, they have to be brought into the light. Because it's in the light that shame cannot survive. It's removed. We have to lead the way. We have to defeat shame. We have to confess sin. And we have to experience healing. In the church, on these topics, we have a ministry, and, and some of you may know this, we have a ministry here called Compass Ministry. There's a group of men that gather every week because they're committed to, to not allowing pornography and sexual addiction to define their lives, and they gather every week to support each other and encourage them. As far as I know, there's, there's between 10 and 20 men in that group, right? Right? That, 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 that's, a, that's a fraction of, of, of who should be in that group. And these are not just male issues, not in our society and culture. The, you can look at the statistics. This is increasingly, this is addicting more and more females. And as the church, we cannot stand by idly and, and, and allow this to continue to claim victory in our society and in this community. We have to act. We have support groups for people who have been the, the victims of sexual abuse and assault. We, we have to be willing as the church to be able to name the evil of those things and to be a place where people receive healing and where, where they gather in community and they can lament what's been done to them. 
We, we as the church have to lead the way. See, because ultimately the, these verses, they're leading us to a, the, the truest reality here. And that ultimately is that Jesus is best. Jesus is best. Again, back in um, Matthew chapter 5, verse 29 and 30, there's this very emphatic expression that Jesus makes here. He says, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. So Jesus uses this, this dramatic language here. Like, I don't know why, but when I, when I was thinking of this this week, I, I pictured um, Indiana Jones. <laughs> And the Last Crusade, and if you remember in that movie, they're after the Holy Grail, right? That's what they're searching for. And there's this scene at the end after they've discovered it, but because they've disrupted this this cave that it's in, it's there's an earthquake that's unfolding, and there's this uh, character Elsa who's been a part of this journey, and as the earth opens up, she falls into this crevasse, and Indiana Jones grabs her and. And she is, is holding on to his hand, but just out of her reach is, is the Holy Grail, the cup of Christ. And, and she's reaching for it, and she's reaching for it, and she, she desires to have it, and yet ultimately that's what causes her to, to fall to her death. See, Jesus is, is he's, he's offering, he, what he wants us to understand is don't exchange a lesser for a greater. No, that, that's wrong. Do exchange a lesser for a greater. Don't exchange a greater for a lesser. He's saying life is ultimately found in me. And this is clearly of great concern for him. Jesus, Jesus wants us to understand that, that sexual desire out of control just doesn't impact the relationships and connections that we have between our, each other. It impacts our, our relationship. It damages our relationship with him. So he, he uses this hyperbole here. He's not, he's not talking about self-mutilation, but he uses this hyperbole to demonstrate this truth. The, the eye and the hand were used in wisdom literature as a, as a picture of how we see and relate and act in the world. So Jesus is he's making a point that, that value and worth, that in our, our culture and society, we've come to believe that that. Our, our worth to be health, happy, healthy, and, and fulfilled in life, that it's impossible without sex. And Jesus is saying to be happy and healthy and fulfilled in your life is impossible without me. So don't exchange uh, uh, something that is greater for something that is less. Jesus isn't, he's not talking about sin management here. Jesus is talking about surgery. That, that removes malignancy of, of loss from our lives because it's devouring us and because it leaves us empty. See, this is Jesus' point. He, he's not saying that lust is this unforgivable sin. He's just saying that if we, don't, if we don't bring it to Jesus, if we don't bring it into the community, into the light of the community of believers, then it consumes us. That, that, it's, that it's eating us alive. And Jesus says, I'm, I love you too much. I, I'm the one who loves and who died for you. And in him and through him, we have life. So he's saying whatever it is that, that keeps us from him, it's, he's saying it's not worth keeping. Jesus says, get, get rid of it. I'm, uh, I'm going to invite the, the worship team to, to come back up here because ultimately there's passage. And, and thank you for sticking with me today. I know this is a, a challenging topic, but as the worship team comes up, I, I, where does this passage leave us? Where, where is it ultimately taking us? It, it leaves us, it takes us back to the place of the love of a Savior who desires for us and who has made a way for us to experience the fullness of life in him. This morning, as we conclude our service, we have the opportunity to, to share in communion. And I've been praying this week, just as we come to this time together, that, that this would be a time for us as the church, that it would be a time of, of confession, 
confession of times when we settle for lesser things, when he is offering us the fullness of, of who he is, that it would be a time of restoration, that we would be reminded of the grace and the forgiveness that he made available to us as a cross. And it would be a time of courage that we, as the church, that we would be the ones who rise up in the world around us and say, this things need to be different. We need to do things differently because we cannot reduce each other down to the realm of, of an object. Jesus says it doesn't, believe, it doesn't belong in, in my kingdom. And so this morning as we come to the table, I pray again that we would be reminded of his incredible love for us, that we would be renewed in that and that we would live that out in relationship to each other. In just a moment when, after I pray, our ushers will pass the communion elements. You'll select both cups, grab both of those at the same time and, and hold on to it. And then I will come up and I will guide us in the receiving of the elements. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that your word does not skip over the difficult topics. Lord, we thank you that your um, design and purpose is, is all around us and that what you create for us is good. So Lord, I pray that the experience and that the wholeness of, of that great, that complex good would be something that we as a church that we run after that we would find fulfillment not in, in, in how we, what relationships we have, but ultimately we would find fulfillment in a relationship with you. Lord, give us boldness and courage as we seek to bring into the light shame and guilt and whatever it is that prevents us from that. And we experience freedom through the grace of Jesus Christ. Ultimately, do not let us exchange that which is of highest value for, for a shadow. And we ask these things in your name. Amen.